Good morning. I'm Dr. James Slover, and I'm going to talk to you about revision knee arthroplasty. This talk will be guided towards preparation for part two of the boards rather than a comprehensive talk of all aspects. I will talk about evaluation and diagnosis, principles of revision knee arthroplasty, and some special considerations that I think may be covered on the board examination. Causes to consider when cons talking about knee revision arthroplasty include femoral, tibial, and patel patellar component loosening, component fracture of any of these components. Please note metal back patella have increased wear and fail more often. Linear wear and osteolysis, which will be more common in tibial trays with screws and certain modular designs than in all polyethylene tibial designs. The role of highly crossing polyethylene is not defined completely in total knee arthroplasty yet, and it may improve wear properties, but may have increased fracture risks of the post, etc. Stiffness, instability, which is now a top reason for revision, infection, and recurrent hemarthrosis or rheumatoid arthritis or other causes of synovitis. Fortunately, more than 90% of people are satisfied with their function after total joint arthroplasty, and it has provided excellent lasting pain relief and improvement in function. However, we all know that some patients will continue to have varying degrees of joint pain, even with apparently well-functioning total joint arthroplasties, and that implants can have issues that require revision. Several studies have identified populations that are more likely to have a better or worse result, including workers' compensation patients and patients with untreated depression or patients with a mismatch between expectations and results. You should look for key words that indicate these are the types of patients in the narratives on the board exam. The full differential diagnosis includes loosening, wear, component malposition, deformity or instability, infection, progressive bone loss, arthrofibrosis, patellofemoral dysfunction, impingement, synophytis, or other inflammatory conditions. Please keep in mind that other sources may cause pain around a knee, including referred pain from the hip or spine, stress fracture, bursitis, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome, as well as crystalline deposition, neurovascular problems, fibromyalgia, and again, mismatch of expectations and results. A detailed history of the patient's symptoms, their operation, and other medical issues must be undertaken, and you should look for these elements in the narratives on the board exam. A thorough exam of the joint in question, as well as the joint above and below, is critical. These will provide the basis for the focused workup of the patient and the eventual treatment options. You want to note the temporal onset, duration, and severity, as well as the location and character of pain described. Was there a pain-free interval? Does the patient have night pain or startup pain? Night pain is more likely to be consistent with infection. Startup pain is likely to be consistent with loosening of the implant. And again, this is pain when, that is severe when a patient first gets up on the knee, is then temporarily relieved, but then can worsen if the patient is too active. You want to look for precipitating factors in the narrative. Was there trauma? Was there any description of delayed wound healing or persistent drainage with the index operation? Are there other medical problems or sources of infection described that would point you in that direction? Never ignore any history or factors that point you towards infection in the narratives on the board examination. When trying to diagnose the source of a pain in a total knee arthroplasty, you need to develop a differential diagnosis that's based on the principles of both probability as well as importance. And again, look at all of the factors in the history, physical exam, and imaging studies that are presented due to you in order to make the appropriate diagnosis. In terms of evaluating treatment, you also need to assess the degree that the pain affects the patient and the degree and severity of the resulting disability when you're deciding on your treatment choice. This is a grid for the evaluation of a painful total knee arthroplasty. Although it's not overly helpful on a board exam situation, if you look through these, it does give you the type of things that you need 
to evaluate in order to come up with a specific diagnosis. For example, for infection, ESR and CRP, as well as aspiration, will be critical. For extensor mechanism rupture, you need to be familiar with the appropriate position of a patella on radiographs and recognize x-rays that indicate that the patella is not appropriately positioned, which will help you make the appropriate diagnosis. For the stiff knee, you want to consider rotation and look for any evidence of internal rotation on a CT scan or patellar tilting on x-rays. Lucencies can help diagnose a loose implant. And again, look for signs of malrotation based on patellar views on the x-rays you're shown. Plain radiographs are virtually always indicated, and serial radiographs help you to look for changes, while stress views can give you a dynamic picture. If a painful total knee arthroplasty is presented in a narrative and x-rays have not been done, this should be your first step. Fluoroscopy can reveal instability by showing dynamic images and any view, whether fluoroscopic or not, that shows asymmetric widening or a narrative that describes a patient with pain with stairs or getting up from chairs can imply instability as a diagnosis and you should start to think about that. Further imaging that is commonly used includes CT scan where you can evaluate component alignment and rotation, as well as examine the implant bone interfaces and lytic lesions around implants. If there are large lytic lesions, you should certainly think about loosening, which may be septic or aseptic. MRI is increasingly being used to evaluate the soft tissue around total knee arthroplasties, but it can also evaluate the metal bone interface and any fluid there can be indicative of loosening. Bone scans are used to identify areas of increased metabolic activity. They're sensitive and not specific and are therefore used less frequently. And I think at this point are best when plain radio radiography and other lab tests are inconclusive, but you still suspect a problem around an implant. Lab studies are primarily used to distinguish between septic and aseptic etiologies. CBC probably has less importance now than ESR and CRP and joint aspiration will be critical in the evaluation of these patients. Preferably, these are done off antibiotics, and they should be sent for everything and evaluated for everything, including infection, crystalline disease, and knees with instability will have red blood cell counts over 50,000 in many cases. Anesthetic injection is another tool that can help be helpful in localizing pain, especially if it related to a soft tissue issue that's local around a knee arthroplasty. Please note that ESR may still be increased for up to one year after total joint arthroplasty and has not been as helpful in differentiating between aseptic or septic loosening as other factors. CRP more typically normalizes at three weeks after total joint arthroplasty and is not typically elevated in aseptic loosening unless the patient has some sort of inflammatory condition but is typically very high in cases of septic arthroplasty. ESR and CRP have good negative predictive value and moderate sensitivity, but their positive predictive value and specificity is not quite as good. Aspiration has moderate sensitivity and has good positive and negative predictive value and is highly specific. And very likely on the boards, you will have to combine these pieces of information when deciding if this is a septic situation or not. Component malposition is something that's frequently evaluated and tested. They're not likely to tell you that a component is malpositioned, but you may see a CT scan report or image that shows internal rotation or see an x-ray like the one on the left with significant patellar tilting. You should note that if you see patellar tilting, I would certainly consider malrotation but knee effusion can cause this as well. And so you need to look at the other factors described in the narrative when making your final decision. On physical exam, internal rotation of the tibia can cause excessive rotation of the foot and ankle, 
And this is something that you may be able to look for in the narratives or the pictures or descriptions shown as another clue that you are dealing with a malrotation issue. Instability is becoming a more frequent cause of revision and is now one of the top causes. You should look for any sign, particularly in a dynamic view, but even a static view of asymmetrical widening of the joint, and this can suggest instability. Extensor mechanism issues and injuries are frequently tested on the board's examination. Always examine the patella closely on any view, including the lateral and sunrise view. Most fractures such as these will be treated non-operatively. ORIF has a very low success rate in the patella after neoarthroplasty due to the avascular nature of the patella. A more prudent treatment can sometimes be excision of a small fragment with reapproximation of the extensor mechanism to the remaining fragment or reconstruction in some cases. If it's a bony injury such as the one shown, you should treat the patient non-operatively with immobilization and extension. More typically, you may see cases or narratives that describe other injuries to the extensor mechanism that do not involve fracture. You need to be able to recognize these on films as well as based on the history and physical exam clues that may be in the narrative. And you need to understand the treatment options for these. These are often, almost always I should say, treated with some type of surgical reconstruction and primary repair has been shown to do very poorly in these cases. Typically an allograft or autograft reconstruction or in some cases a mesh augmented reconstruction may be indicated. I think the mesh would be most commonly indicated if the implant is also being revised but it may be indicated in other chronic situations as well. Be sure to secure the patient in maximum tension. And it's very important that these cases, which have a very high failure rate, be treated with full extension after surgery, most likely in a cast. The only scenario where I would not use a cast would be a brace where I kept it locked in extension and there should be information in the narrative indicating the patient would be at very high risk in a cast due to skin issues or other vascular issues. Look at the physical exam findings that are given to you on the narratives and look for any evidence of peripheral nerve injury. Early post-op perineal nerve dysfunction should be treated with knee flexion in the recovery room, but you should look for more subtle signs such as numbness, tingling, weakness, and atrophy that are described in the narrative. Look for any evidence of vascular injury or compromised. It may not be obvious with absent pulses or a blue foot, but diminished pulses or vasculopathy type changes may be described to indicate that there is a vascular issue and that further workup, vascular consultation, and potentially surgical treatment is needed. The infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve is a source of medial pain and these type of local pain issues can sometimes be raised and they may not require knee revision, but may require other treatments such as selective injection, other symptomatic treatments, or even cold therapies or nerve ablation type therapies. Patients with complex regional pain syndrome need to be treated, but they should not be treated with surgery. We're all familiar with the common features of this type of response, which include severe pain out of proportion, significant pain with gentle stroking of the skin, as well as severe descriptions of pain, such as shown here. If a patient with complex regional pain syndrome is presented, the treatment should include referral to neurology and nerve stabilization medicines, as well as gentle therapies, including gentle physical therapy and other modalities, but nothing aggressive and certainly nothing surgical in a patient who seems to have complex regional pain syndrome. As we said earlier, and as we all know, we always need to examine the joint above and below in a total joint arthroplasty question if we are able to.
This is the hip x-ray of a patient in my practice that had a knee revision, got no relief, and the reason is because the source of pain was from the hip. This may appear in the boards less directly with descriptions of pain with gentle rotation of the leg or log rolling or stiffness of the leg that restricts the ability to tie shoes and socks or other factors that may indicate a further evaluation of the hip is needed rather than knee revision. And always keep that in mind when determining the next step in treatment and evaluation on your board's narratives. Deep infection is a significant problem in total joint arthroplasty and is very likely to appear on the board's examination in some fashion. You want to look for historical points that point towards infection in your narratives. Are there factors that indicate the patient's more prone to infection? Do they describe any perioperative course issues that suggest infection, such as prolonged drainage that we mentioned earlier? Was there a pain-free interval, or does the patient feel that they've had severe pain since the surgical procedure, which does suggest infection. Does the pain pattern support the diagnosis of infection, which is generally a more diffuse pain as opposed to a focal or intermittent pinching type pain? And has the patient been described to have had recent infections or other potential sources? Things on the exam that you can look for that may indicate this include evidence of significant swelling, skin warmth, drainage, or erythema, a patient who is described to have painful or diminished range of motion, a patient who's reported to begin using an ambulatory device after getting rid of that device, and certainly any patient with open wounds or active infections elsewhere, you need to consider infection of the knee arthroplasty. Lab tests and aspiration will always be indicated if this is on the differential. CBC probably less important, but ESR and CRP, as well as aspiration, which is sent for everything, should be performed. Plain x-rays may have some features that indicate the etiology, including periosteal bone formation, endosteal scalloping, or extensive generalized osteolysis, or rapidly progressive osteolysis, all of which can point towards a septic etiology. CT scan may demonstrate this as well with significant lytic lesions that compromise bone stock significantly around the joint. Lucencies around implants may or may not be normal. Lucencies that are more concerning are those that are progressive over time, that are more than 2 millimeters wide. If they're accompanied with associated significant bone destruction or obviously if the joint is painful. Historical points to look for is the patient's pain activity related and relieved by rest. That's more likely to be mechanical or related to aseptic loosening than a septic process. Does a patient have startup pain to suggest that the implant is loose? Is the implant susceptible? We talked about before, tibial trays with screws through them and certain modular tibial trays are more likely to have osteolysis related to backside wear and other issues. And again, always think, is there anything in the narrative that's suggestive of infection? Is there synovitis present? Does the, does the narrative describe a patient with new mechanical symptoms that were not there from the beginning? And again, anything to suggest infection. Plain radiographs, always indicated. CT scan, nuclear imaging, and MRI may be indicated depending on the situation. If you see migration of a component, a component fracture, or a cement fracture, just like total hip arthroplasty, that is an implant that is definitely loose. If you see a radiolucent line that is continuous or greater than 2 millimeters in some area, that is probably loose. And if you see a radius in line that's about half of the implant, then that's possibly loose. Some principles that I want to go over for the board's examination. Surgical exposure and approach is an important issue in knee arthroplasty. It can be more difficult due to the scar tissue or to stiffness of the patient's knee. 
There are certain techniques that increase the ability to perform the operation, and the most common is the rectus snip shown here on the right. This is a powerful approach that increases exposure and has no change in post-operative rehab protocol. Other more extensile approaches include tibial tubercle osteotomy shown on the left and the patellar turndown shown on the right. Tibial tuber tubercle osteotomies do have some risk of osteotomy fracture or non-union, as well as pain from the hardware that is used to fix the tubercle after the case. Patella turndowns are particularly noted to have problems with extensor lag and I think are very rarely used with the one exception of possibly taking down a knee fusion for an arthroplasty. The number one rule with skin issues in life and certainly in the boards is to react aggressively and early. I don't think on the boards they will be looking for you to start antibiotics on a patient who has a skin issue after knee arthroplasty. Any evidence of skin necrosis, whether in the description or in a picture, you should have very immediate intervention by plastics with likely flap and skin grafting. If the narrative describes prolonged drainage, likely the best answer is to operate. If you see risk factors in the narrative, such as smoking, rheumatoid arthritis, steroid use, obesity, history of irradiated skin or multiple incisions, have a low threshold to have plastics and or vascular evaluation before your revision is done. Midline incisions have the most safety, but you want to keep flaps full thickness. If there are multiple incisions, in general, you will choose the lateral most incision and you should consider a plastics consult. The one exception could be if an incision was recently used and other incisions are much, much older, but in general, it's going to be the most lateral incision, as long as it's not too lateral to actually do the case. You can consider a sham incision where you make an incision and then close to make sure it heals, or where you make an incision and perform a small part of the operation, such as removal of some hardware, and then close. And if there's any issue described with the surgical procedure, with the closure of the arthrotomy or the skin, you should have a low threshold for considering immobilization postoperatively to keep them in extension and allow healing without tension during the initial period. Implant removal is an important part of knee revision arthroplasty, but I don't think it's likely an important part of what's tested on the board examination. I will say that you must protect the extensor mechanism during the case. And if there's any description that that may be at risk, you should have a low threshold for a quadriceps snip or other steps to protect it. And don't try to fix something that's malpositioned or malrotated with a simple soft tissue procedures, but rather revives those implants which will give the best chance for long-term results. I want to talk briefly about implant choice and revision total knee arthroplasty. We'll talk a little bit about type, fixation, defects, bearing surface, and ligaments. Generally, cancellous graft is better than structural, especially for contained defects in knee arthroplasty. For fixation choice, you have a choice of cemented or uncemented. Generally speaking, I think for revision knee arthroplasty, cement is always indicated at the joint line. Cemented versus uncemented stems is a different issue, and we'll talk briefly about that. If you see a defect or a defect is described that's more than three to five millimeters, you will need an augment, and as long as that augment is supported by bone, immediate weight bearing is still possible and recommended. When I think of fixation in revision knee arthroplasty, I think of three areas, the joint line, metaphysis, and diaphysis. In primary knee arthroplasty, we get away with fixation at the joint line only because our cuts are anatomic to the prosthesis and can be very precise. In a revision situation where there's bone loss and compromised bone, this is often not the case, and you need support from the metaphysis and or the diaphysis. As a general rule, I think you need two of the three in a revision situation. 
So if the joint line is significantly compromised, you will need both the metaphysis and diaphysis to help support it. If the joint line does have reasonable support, then you will need one of the others, at least, to, to support your implant. Here's a case of a knee that has collapsed into varus and has significant medial bone loss. You can see that we reconstructed this using a medial augment and tried to get that bearing on bone as much as we could and supported that with a cone in the metaphysis and a stem in the diaphysis on the far right diagram. Here is a case with a knee spacer in place, and when the spacer is removed, there's significant bone loss. The joint line provides essentially no fixation. Therefore, this implant was supported with a large sleeve and stem to give metaphyseal and diaphyseal support. I do not think they will ask you to choose between different sleeve or stem styles on the boards, but they may ask you whether you would use them or not. And I think you wanna make sure you have enough support for your implant. Regarding stems, I think it's not clear whether cemented or uncemented is the preferred type in all situations. And I don't think you will be asked to make that differentiation very frequently. Again, this shows that same case, how much bone loss there actually is at the joint when the spacer is removed. Here's a case that I think is something that commonly comes up and may be tested on the boards. And this is a fracture around the distal femur in a patient with a total knee arthroplasty. In this particular case, the patient was young and we reconstructed them by plant implanting a large cone and cementing a long stem through that. In more elderly patients, a distal femoral replacement may be preferred due to the comminution and osteopenia and osteoporosis that's likely present in the bone. As a general rule, if the fracture extends distal to the proximal most aspect of the femoral flange on the lateral view, then you will need to revise the knee arthroplasty. If the fracture is proximal to that, you may be able to retain the knee arthroplasty and fix most often with a lateral locking plate but also possibly with a intramedullary nail. Regarding stems, as I said, I don't think it's clear uh, what is most appropriate, but in the elderly patient and the fracture patient, I think a cemented stem would be my choice on the board examination. As far as the ligament status, if the narrative reflects instability of the medial and lateral collateral ligaments, or there is obvious that it would likely be unstable or compromised because of the amount of bone loss or deformity, then a hinge knee replacement prosthesis may be indicated. Again, stems, they can cause tibial pain and perforation can occur. There's a trend to the use of shorter cemented stems in revision knee arthroplasty with metaphyseal fixation to avoid that stem tibial pain. I doubt that they would ask you to make that kind of choice, but that's something to consider if they do. I think cemented stem do allow for some alignment adjustments due to the natural bowing of the femur and tibia, as well as any deformities. And they do provide some protection in the very osteoporotic patient. So if you see that, you may want to choose a cemented stem if it's coming down to that choice. A brief word about the patella. I think it's okay to leave it alone and unresurfaced if it's been removed. ORIF is very low likelihood of success after knee arthroplasty as previously discussed due to the avascularity of the patella. Patella tendon rupture, primary pair has very poor results. The one exception may be a patient who avulses directly off the tubercle and is repaired with anchors and placed in a cast. But even then, I would consider an allograft support to increase the chance of success. 
You can bone graft a central defect in a patella and cover it with soft tissue or use a trabecometal implant. I'm not sure this would come up on the boards, but if it did, it would be in a patient that had significant anterior pain, difficulty with stairs, and getting up from a chair due to unresurfaced patella. If you do use a trabecometal patella, post-op rehab can be similar to a typical knee revision. Briefly about lateral release, it's very commonly needed in knee arthroplasty to help improve tracking. This is due to the extensive scar tissue that forms, which is opened up on the medial side to a greater degree than the lateral side. But again, I would caution using lateral release alone as a treatment for any patellar maltracking. It can enhance improved tracking in the revision scenario but should not be used in replacement of revision of malrotated components. A brief word about fractures. A femur fracture proximal to the implant can be fixed with either an IM nail or a locking plate, as we mentioned. Fractures of the epicondyle that have occurred during surgery, which is most common during a PS knee where a box is being cut out, can be typically be fixed with a compression screw if it's intraoperative, and you should add a stem to support that. A epicondyl fracture seen postoperatively that's minimally or non-displaced can typically be treated non-operatively with restricted weight bearing. On the tibia side, you want to bypass any fractures with a longer stem. You can use a cancellous screw if it involves the plateau intraoperatively. Fractures distal to the stem are treated with RIF and the tubercle should be fixed with RIF if a fracture is seen there. If you see a case that involves stiffness after knee arthroplasty, always evaluate for the causes before initiating treatment. This includes infection, instability, and malrotation. Idiopathic arthrofibrosis can occur, and that can be treated with manipulation under anesthesia typically in less than six months from surgery. Although manipulation under anesthesia has been reported to be successful at later times, it's less predictable. Arthroscopic lysis of adhesions can be considered when other causes are ruled out as well. This may include a manipulation at the same time. Generally speaking, I think this would be less than a year or so from surgery. More chronic cases are more likely to need knee revision but again, you should identify a cause before initiating a knee revision in a patient. And revisions without a diagnosis have 50% or less chance of success. So in conclusion, although joint replacement remains a very successful operation for relieving pain and restoring function with high patient satisfaction, some patients have suboptimal results and continued pain. The evaluation of these patients requires a consideration of a broad differential diagnosis, and you need to look at the factors in the detailed history, physical exam, and imaging and lab studies to determine the cause. An appropriate surgical treatment should only be performed after a cause has been identified. Thank you and good luck.